There it goes. Word about the following tape. This tape is designed for security professionals, locksmiths, cops, private detectives, people who need to know this kind of material. Obviously, we couldn't restrict the sales. There's no convenient way to make sure somebody doesn't watch a tape. Um, so we simply have to say this information exists. We have correlated it. This is probably the most comprehensive look at entry procedures ever been attempted anywhere. We think we've done a good job of it in this tape you're going to learn everything from picking simple locks to the myths of high security locks little known ways of getting into everything from padlocks to bank vaults you're going to see us steal a mercedes a corvette a ferrari we are going to blow up a safe we're going to use burning bars we're going to use everything can be done to get in someplace at the same time realize we're also showing the other end of it use this as a guide to what security you want for your valuables or what security you need in your home and also use it when investigating crimes we've tried to show the marks the uh, things that are left behind by various entry procedures so you can evaluate it uh, in a report you can understand what kind of tool was or wasn't used you can tell if an entry was faked look at the film from all these angles uh, we think you'll enjoy it we think you'll come out no matter even if you're a practice locksmith we think you'll come out with some things that you didn't know some tools and some techniques we've used a number of experts in this film on various different things from explosives to lock picking uh, some of whom don't want their name mentioned but we'd like to thank everybody who was involved uh, please take the tape for what's intended study it play it back practice the things involved we think it'll make you better at whatever you're doing. Thanks. The first thing to consider when considering entry into a building is how the building is built. Run a security survey. Look at the type of construction. Not all burglaries are through a door. Oftentimes access is achieved much easier by going through another part of the building. Is the roof thin? Can it be chopped through? Are there skylights that can easily be broken or entered? Are there windows? in the upper portion that are open or easily attacked is access to balconies available. All these things should be considered when trying to decide how to enter a building. In this particular instance, we note that the building has an electronically opened garage door. This is an easy fault. Garage doors that open this way can be forced against their rails quite easily without using the correct sim command symbols. We're gonna take a crowbar and attack the edge of one of these doors and you'll see how easy it is. If, perchance, you own a building with an electronically open garage door, reinforce the hinge edges and the railing corners so this can't be done. First thing we're going to look at here is spring type plungers. Now this is a common door lock used on most doors where the uh, bolt is not a dead bolt but rather is held in place by spring pressure. In other words you can push it back by pushing against the spring. So when I shut the door the bolt will retract and be held in place. This locks the door. This is a lock normally is a key and knob lock locks from the inside this is common on houses apartment buildings hotels etc 
This is the infamous lock we see in all the James Bond movies where somebody gets a credit card and opens the door to the CIA safe house. That is possible. Way to tell if it's possible is to look at the door and see which way it opens and shuts. The bevel on the bolt will face opposite the way the door opens in normal doors. In other words, I have a flat side facing me and a beveled side facing the inside or safe part of this locked compartment. If I am trying to get entry from this side, it is possible to take a credit card, slip it between the door frame and the bevel part of the bolt, pushing the bevel back and opening the door. A better system is to use a putty knife. Even a kitchen knife will work, but a putty knife is flat, broad, very thin, and will go between the door frame and the bevel quite easily, forcing the bevel, due to its natural angle, back. This is very well and good, except for the fact that we're trying to enter from the outside, which is a normal situation with these kind of locks. So instead of a bevel, I'm placing a locked, flat portion of the bolt. Let's take a look at a couple ways that this can be defeated. First of all, I'm going to lock the door. And if we don't get in, this is it. So, And we'll take a look at the bolt and see how to defeat this. These are two examples of linoleum cutting knives or scoring knives. They're extremely sharp, which is evidenced by this cut you'll notice in my knuckle. When I was practicing this move, because of the shape of the knives, they can be used to push or pull, depending on their curvature, a spring-loaded bolt. Now, in this instance, since we've ascertained the door opens outward, the flat part is facing us, we know we have to retract the bolt this way. I'm going to choose the knife with the more radical circle cut. I could use this knife to push if it was a flat, or rather a beveled bolt. I'm going to reach inside between the door jam and the door itself, grabbing the bolt with this knife, retracting the knife towards me, and trying to force the spring bolt that's how long it takes to open this type of door, which is still locked, you'll notice. All I did was slip the bolt. You can see scratch marks on the bolt itself if you're investigating this type of thing. Look for scratch marks across the top of the bolt and down the face of the bolt made by this knife as it retracts the spring into the door, opening the door. It leaves the door locked, but it does allow bypass entry without picking. There's one other way to defeat these locks that I find quite expedient. Let's lock it again, shut the door. Now I'm going to get, this is an ice pick or an awl. It's fairly sharp, fairly sturdy. What I'm going to attempt to do with this is again go between the strike plate that's mounted on the wall and the door into the bolt. In order to make this function, I need to actually go into the surface of the bolt, which luckily is made of fairly soft metal. So we're going to jam the ice pick into the bolt, then retract the bolt by pressure. And you can see, as we zoom in, or as we get on the bolt here, that the ice pick is actually sticking into the bolt. And that's all the pressure it takes to retract the spring of this bolt into the lock, opening the door. Again, we've not unlocked the lock. When I let go, it will spring back out. Look for pucker marks indentations, slots on the bolt, showing it's been forced back. This is a very simple entry that beats 99% of the locks mounted on apartment buildings, condos, houses, and some offices in this country. When we approach a lock like this, be sure to remember that any of the alternate or usual picking techniques will also work in this lock. In other words, I could pick it with picks, I could single pick it, I could use a snap gun, I could impression it. All these things are viable. To illustrate that point, we're going to use our trusty Cobra electronic pick. Use the tension wrench, the bottom of the keyway, so I'm going to use the other end of the tension wrench, providing enough space to let the pick vibrate the pins. I've adjusted the throw of the pick to be shorter than normal, so I can still get it in here and get some vibration, hopefully. Okay, here we go. Uh -huh. Now I'm going to vary the tension on the pick as normal. Vibrate the pins up and down. Release the tension and go back. And we've got it. Amazingly enough, most locks used on American doors fall into three categories. 
three brand names, Westlock, Quicklock, or Corbin. The most popular is probably Quicklock. Now, Quicklock is a key and knob lock, as is this one. Requires the usual manipulation to get it open, except it has one major fault. If you know it's a quick lock because you can recognize the locks or because you've seen the name on this one, you can place screw, first of all, pry the guard ring out by placing a screwdriver in. Guard ring comes out very easily, exposing the plug cylinder and the lock. Now, on a quick lock, you can insert screwdrivers at both ends of the lock, pry towards yourself, the lock will pop out the cylinder, leaving the mechanism exposed so you can stick a screwdriver in and open the door. This leaves virtually no marks, especially if you put the ring back on afterwards. The only way to tell this has happened is by noticing there might be slight etching marks at the top and bottom of the lock. A Corbin is a more expensive door lock. It's harder to open. In fact, a Corbin uses mushroom pins which we've discussed in our picking section, making it extremely hard to pick a high security lock. Corbin popped the ring off, put a screwdriver in at the 12 o'clock position, and you can pop the cylinder right out and open the lock with a screwdriver, thereby defeating the entire high security idea of a Corbin lock, and also not leaving marks once the ring is put back in. This happens to be a West lock, which is probably the most popular lock in America right now. Every tract built home, every condo tends to have this kind of lock. Once you've popped the guard ring off, a west lock, you insert a screwdriver at the nine o'clock position, pry the cylinder out, then you insert a awl or a scribe over the nine o'clock position, right over the screwdriver, you'll feel inside, you'll feel the lock mechanism. So the cylinder pops completely out of the lock. It virtually lets me reach in with a screwdriver, turn the knob, and open the door. The important thing to remember is the cylinder can be put back into position. You'll notice there are scratch marks on it from my practice runs and my bin marks from popping it out. But if you don't know where to look, those are almost invisible. And once I put the ring back, the lock's as good as new. With practice, a pro can open these three most popular locks in America in about two seconds each. That's how good security is on most of our doors right now. So to sum it up, the three most popular locks in America protecting your and my valuables, our loved ones, God knows what else. The West Lock, Quick Lock, the Corbin. Screwdriver and an all, two screwdrivers. Work around the parameter, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Pop the uh, cylinder, and a good pro can do it faster than that. Stick a screwdriver in, unlock it, open the door. A good pro can do that in about two seconds. Then you can reinsert the cylinder, reinsert the guard ring around the cylinder, covering most of the marks that I made, or if you're good, all the marks. And the lock is effectively, by effectively bypassed in a couple seconds. No key. No skill needed. We can tell this is a deadbolt lock simply by looking at it. The cylinder is protected by an anti-removal guard as a strike plate. There's a block of wood here that looks decorative that prevents us from jimmying in here. Most applications would require us prying this wood off first in order to get at the deadbolt for hacksawing or prying or jimmying. The other options are, of course, to try and pick the lock, impression the lock, use the electronic pick on the lock, or, as we'll demonstrate in other parts of the film, if we know where the set screws are, we can drill out the set screws or actually drill out the shear pin of the lock. This is a normal setup for a deadbolt lock. When we approach a door that we know has a deadbolt, as we've already seen, the bolt actually goes into the frame of the house, we have several options. If we're not worried about leaving marks of our passage, first thing to look at is uh, is it a hollow door? This door could be chopped through very easily. Are there windows nearby that could be broken with tape over them to reach inside and unlock? Or does the door itself have glass in it? Obviously, this one does not. One of the techniques at that point is to try and jimmy the door. This means separating the door from the frame 
for enough clearance for the deadbolt to drop loose from the frame, opening the door. Common jimmy tools are simply crowbars and pry bars. Sometimes one has to peel away plates or intrusions that are placed there to stop exactly this kind of entrance. Obviously, this will leave marks of its passage. Once one has access to the door frame, place the tools in opposite directions and pry the door apart. If you can pry it enough so the deadbolt comes out and drops free and clear, you have entry. If not, you can take a wedge. Placing the wedge in the door behind one of the pry bars will help pry the door open as well as help cushion the marks left against the door frame. If you're investigating this sort of entry, of course, you look for pry marks by the door frame as well as actual pry marks on the door itself. This still may not work if the deadbolt has been constructed correctly and is a half an inch or so long. Trying to pry it apart even with a wedge and two jimmies may not separate it out. If you can get access to the deadbolt at all by prying or removing a strike plate, you have another option. That is, take a hacksaw blade, a common strong hacksaw blade in a holder, put it through perhaps prying at the same time until you reach the deadbolt and hacksaw through the deadbolt, opening the door. It's also possible in some deadbolts to simply get access to the deadbolt, place a bar on top of the deadbolt itself. Now remember, the bolt is designed to prevent entry. It's not constructed to stop up and down motion. If you can pry the door open enough to get a shove knife or a bar on top of the deadbolt itself, take a sledge, pound downward on the deadbolt, and you may actually knock the deadbolt loose enough to open the door. Obviously, this will damage the strike plate, damage the inside of the door, and will leave fairly obvious markings afterwards. If you get a deadbolt open, only to discover there's a chain on it, some chains lock from the inside, sometimes people leave through other exits, there's a way to defeat that using a rubber band the thumbtack. You reach in, loop the rubber band around the chain as far back as you can get it, take the thumbtack, pin it inside the door as far as you can reach, and then loop the rubber band around it. Then when you shut the door, with luck, the rubber band will pull the chain out of its slot and pop the uh, chain out. We'll have to take a look at that from the inside. It's also one other method, and that's to simply open the door and take the chain off. Let's take a look from the other side. This is an example of a barrel lock used on the inside of doors to secure it, usually when someone's home. The barrel lock operates by sliding a rod over. Of course, the door has a small bracket that the rod goes into and you put the lock the barrel locking mechanism up and it locks the door preventing it from opening now the way to open this there's a couple ideas normally when this kind of lock is used it's used on a wooden door that will have a lot of tolerance hopefully so there's a crack between both doors especially if the door is old and warped or weather worn what you do on this is the lock is locked there's enough Tolerance, you can put a hacksaw blade in. Of course, you could saw the lock with a blade. However, if you can get one hacksaw blade in, you can get two hacksaw blades in. This is two hacksaw blades, as you can see, are rubber banded together almost in the middle. The rough serrated edges are facing inward on the blades. When you use this, you stick it at the lock locked, you stick it in the crack in the door, grab the barrel, the uh, rod of the barrel with the hacksaw blades, you see my hands here, squeeze the blades, turn the barrel, and you can see it come down, let it go, and then work the barrel in with the crack using the blades as grabbers. This will allow you to get space, clearance, and open the other door. Of course, this usually means somebody's inside the room you're trying to get in because the lock's locked from the inside unless they went on another entrance, another exit. Uh, this is a good trick, works with most doors if there's any tolerance on it at all. Here we have our lovely test door. 
This is a plumber's tool. It's a wrench used to hold pipes. It uses chain, some serrated steel edges for friction. This is probably the ultimate in black bag kind of jobs. If you want to get in someplace fast, you've got a knob or some sort of lock to get a hold of, you can apply great pressure by tightening this chain around whatever it is you're going to do and then forcing it. Until it comes off. Obviously, it's going to leave some marks of your passing. It'll never be the same. Another possibility when using the pipe chain wrench is simply to lock it around the knob, turning the knob until you break the holding screws. There we go. Removing the knob. In this case, I think we've also removed the entire unit. We've broken it off, leaving a nice retractor hole so we can operate tractor and open the door. Simple and alternate entry methods include loosening set screws when access is available, as well as taking full advantage of hanging or false ceilings to crawl over locked doors and other barriers. Now for an example of karma. While we were filming this video, someone tried to break into our office. We used a very novel method. This is the back door. Like most doors in California, it has a push bar, a fire bar, you can barely see on the other side of the door for emergency exits. We have a nice sticker inside saying the door is alarmed and will go off if anyone opens the door. It's a lie. Someone figured that out. They came to the door with a portable drill and drilled a hole right here where you can see this nice plug, inserted a stiff rod behind it, tried the fire bar, opened the door, and walked in. Very novel method. They didn't get to the inside offices because we have high security locks on those and alarms. But they opened this door with a simple drill, a wire, pushed the bar open. One thing to remember when you're working in various environmental situations, something we encountered in making this film. We shot this film all over the country from California to Florida. Occasionally you run into hazards. You've got to learn to deal with these and just go on. For instance, in Florida we had trouble with alligators. They attacked us. We still got the lock open. We were in Hawaii, and we had lizard problems. They attacked us. We got the locks open. We were in Florida. We had, ouch, blowfish problems. They attacked us. We still got the locks open. And of course, in New York, we had dead rats. One of the worst environmental hazards you can run into, but we still got the locks open. Let's look at some common picking tools. These include singles, rakes, tension tools, and even some of the latest rocker picks, which are generated by computers. A medium set is usually plenty for our applications. You'll also notice one very clever key ring that contains a tension tool and pick. These are the tips for a close-up look at some of the more common picking tools. This is a look at cylinder assembly and disassembly. This is a key and knob lock. We're going to take the plug out by pushing out slightly, which gives us a ring we can remove. And then, with gentle pressure, push the plug through. This leaves the plug free. And now the cylinder is held in the plug, as you can see by a retaining screw or ring on the back of the plug. In the cylinder itself, we have the springs, the drivers, the plugs, and masters, if there are any. This is a look at a Morty cylinder, which contains the same type of plug as the key and knob. In this particular lock, we do not have two screws on the back, but rather a small spring, which holds in the plug in the housing. We'll press down on this little pin, releasing the spring, and then we'll unscrew the back of the plug, removing the plug from the housing. At this point, you've got to be very careful because the pins are in both the plug and the housing. And we've already moved the housing to the shear line and turned it slightly.
cheapest drawing right here is look at pin tumblers, drivers, and pins, springs. The red line you see here is the shear line. And this is the key. This is the correct key fitting. You can see how the pins fit in the lands of the key, creating a line, a shear line slightly, actually slightly above the edge of the lock, allowing this entire cylinder to now turn. The correct key or the correct picking action will line up at the shear line. Here we can see the plug coming out from the housing. Now remember the upper pins are in the housing, the lower pins are in the plug. We're putting a follower, which is simply a piece of wood or a small metal tube to maintain the pressure on the springs and the drivers in the housing itself. Now we are going to remove the pins in the housing one by one, keeping track of the order. And we have a first pin out already and you'll notice there's a small wafer and a pin that make up our first driver pin so right away we know there are master keys in this lock now we're going to continue removing the pins and the springs from the housing one by one leaving them in the correct order as we take them out this is very important for making keys or for reassembly now the main reason we're doing this is to make a key from this lock by disassembling the lock. One of the common reasons this is done is people who are hotel thieves often do this. Now you can see we've taken all the pins out and the drivers and a couple master pins that were located inside the cylinder. We still have pins remaining in the plug, but they're lined up at the shear line as we can see the plug housing spins with the correct key in the lock. We're at the shear line. Now, as we remove the key, we can see the pins go up and down as the key cuts run over them. Now, these pins must also be removed one by one in the correct order. When we put the driver pin back on where it should be, we notice the shear line is broken and the housing will no longer go on. Now, if we put the correct key in, of course, that will raise that driver up to the shear line, as we can see, and would allow the lock to open. Thereby, by comparing the length of the pins, we can tell how deep the key should be cut. Hotel thieves often check in with a bunch of new locks, the same type as used on the hotel, take the one off the door, put a new lock in while they're doing this, disassemble it, make a key. By taking two keys apart, you can determine what are the masters and grandmasters and make uh, those keys by taking two locks apart. Now here we're removing the pins from the plug itself, covering all but the pin we're removing. We go one at a time, line them back up with their correct drivers. Now there we know is a master pin because a little wafer came out, so we know there's another shear line on that pin. Master pins make it easier to pick as well as easier to impression. When we get the pins out, we can decide if we want to make a master or a regular key. Now here are the pins along with the correct key and master. Now we know the bottom pins go in the back. And then we notice that we need two masters. The second master is, of course, here. Now that gives us a shear line. Now our educated guess would be that a master or grandmaster uses a separate shear line, but this one doesn't because we can see there are other pins, other master wafers rather, that were in the housing besides the ones that were actually in the plug. Notice we're using tweezers to carefully remove the pins and keep them in order. Now we know there's a second shear line in there. We can see our shear line is working with this key, but we know another key line exists, another shear line exists. 
and we know it would be higher because, of course, adding the wafers is going to move the plugs up. Now, by putting a blank in, we can ascertain there are no more master pins in there. We've raised all the bottom pins up just by inserting the proper blank into the keyway. This tells us that we have removed and replaced all the pins correctly. Now, if we cut a key to fit those pins there, in other words, we cut a key to fit all the bottom pins, we will have a standard or a change key, which gives us a flush shear line and opens the lock. You can see by inserting the key that we do have a flush shear line. Now we must put the master pins back in carefully, which are in one and three in this case. And now we'd have to cut our key deeper to compensate for those pins. That would give us the master. This is a fairly simple job and it can be made even easier by using depth keys, which we'll show in a couple of minutes, to get the correct cuts, whether using a file, a grinder, or a key machine. But now if we make a key to fit all the bottom pins, we have a standard. Now we're inserting the master and we notice that the bottom pins are correct. When we put in the master wafers, the master key will operate the lock. Now we know that the master wafers that were still up in the case, we know the master would allow that to fall into the plug. So we're going to have to cut deeper to fit those remaining master wafers to get the correct master or grand master. So our master key will again give us a flush shear line by dropping the master wafers into the plug. Again, this cutting can be done with a file or a cutter or a machine. Now there's the blank and we cut it for all the bottom pins. And then we'd cut it deeper for any of the pins, the top pins that remained in. This would give us the master key. Now we're going to reassemble, we're going to put all the bottom pins back in, including the wafers. I will set it aside for a moment. I'm going to take a follower and put it back into the housing, the cylinder. Now when reassembling the lock, we replace the springs, they're going to be under tension. Therefore the follower is used to hold the spring and the driver in. We cover each one up with the follower as we reassemble a cylinder. And we push the follower forward to cover that driver using the pressure of the follower to hold it in place. Again, we can see the shear line on the follower. This drawing is showing us the inside of a pin tumbler lock with both a change key, that is the normal regular key, inserted. Now the key would fit under here, of course, lining up the pins to the shear line. Now you'll notice the extra driver pins, the small flat wafers, the first two cylinders of this lock. This is the change key, this will open the lock. The shear line is correct. However, you'll notice another shear line is created here when the master key is put in. Now this creates the opposite effect using these little wafer driver tumblers to give it a second shear line. Now these, of course, can be coded in every lock. So the shear line is created so the master key will open every lock or as many locks as we want it to fit, or the change key will only open this individual lock. Now you'll notice it's important to us that it gives us two shear lines, two or more shear lines, 
So when you're picking, your odds of opening are much better. You can also see how if you take two locks apart, lay out the pins, you have a good chance of figuring out which is the master key pinning. On one lock, it's pretty hard because it can be the high line, it can be the low line. Two locks, you can tell which they're using for the master key, which they're using with the change key. Additional locks might have a grand master, a grand grand master that will open more locks by using, of course, more of these little wafers to use the pins for the uh, new key. Master change. Another method of opening the lock besides using the key is to use a pick. Now we're going to demonstrate single picking first. Unfortunately, regardless of television, picking takes two tools in most cases. This is a tension tool. We've inserted that in the bottom of the keyway so there's enough room for a single pick to fit over the tension wrench and go into the keyway. The pick is going to raise each pin to the shear line individually. As it does this, the tension will give up a little bit each time. The tension traps the drivers above the shear line in the housing and holds them there until we have the entire thing open. This, you can have to move the tension forward sometimes and relax sometimes. If the pins get trapped, you've moved them too high up, you have to release tension and let them drop back down. You can't see the pins being picked, so this takes a lot of practice. Different tolerances and different locks make some easy to pick, some harder. Again, we've dissolved here to show the time elapsed. We have picked the lock. Now, if it's off more than 15 degrees, as you can see here, it is picked. Tension wrench can be used to open it. Sometimes the latch will bind even though the lock is picked. Tension wrench, in this case, can be removed as long as the tension is retained and a screwdriver or key blank can be put in to actually use the locking mechanism to move it the entire way. This is a look at action of a rake pick. This lovely drawing approximates a rake pick. You see the springs, you can see the drivers, uh, you can see the uh, pins. Now there's no shear line marked here, but it would be someplace when all these spaces are lined up correctly. Rake pick fits in the keyhole, so it's not binding, underneath the pins, and then is moved back and forth with a slight up and down tension. This rakes these pins up and down rapidly. If a little tension is applied to the core at the same time, these openings can catch on the shear line, the edge of the lock creating the shear line. A little tension, rake back and forth to create the shear line. This is the action of a rake pick inside a pin tumbler lock. Another method of picking that works much faster is called raking. Raking takes advantage, as we've shown, of energy transmission to actually bounce or rake the pins against the driver. Put the rake in, put slight tension on, pull the rake out with quite a bit of effort as you see us doing here, relax tension, and we pick the lock. Often raking will pick it that fast. This is a computerized pick designed to rock back and forth. Since we know this keyway, we can choose this pick by sight. Put it in, apply tension, rock up and down, rocking the pins to their shear line. These are brand new picks. They work quite effectively. This is an actual time on this picking, except, as I said, we know what the lockway looks like, so we've chosen the pick to fit. This doesn't take near the energy or force of raking. When you're raking, you will adjust the tension back and forth and rake hard, rake soft. Another method of doing this even faster is to use a snap gun. A snap gun bounces the pins up and down with a short knife. Every time you pull the trigger, you apply pen tension, the pins bounce apart and open. An electro electronic pick gun does the same thing even faster. Now we're going to look at impressioning. Impressioning is the art of making a key without disassembling the lock. First begin with the correct key blank, take a flat file, file it, as you see us doing here, to bring the key to a knife point. Find the flattest side of the blank, start angling it over, and file it to a knife point. Let me, let me remind you when you're picking, it depends 
upon your speed, the tension, and your accuracy. Practice till you get the feel, individually picking, then move to raking, then try the snap gun. Now here you see the knife point being developed. We now need to darken it so we can see the marks left by the pins. We're darkening it here by passing it back and forth in the flame of a cigarette lighter. Notice the smoke left on it. Now we place the key in a vice grip, make it very tight, insert it smoothly and gently into the lock so it doesn't scratch on the way in, and then back and forth very hard as you see, pull it out nice and slow. Now you should be able to see little notches left on the key itself by the pins. We now file down on those notches. Let's take a closer look at the notches. We can see the actual notches left by that rubbing back and forth and the spring pressure pressing the pins into the key blank. You can notice a little mark there. Most keys do not use a zero cut. Knowing that, you can often take a set of depth keys for that type of key and file down to the number one cut immediately. This will give you a better start and a more accurate start for your marks. Once we have established where the marks are, the first cut is very important. Put it on the blank, pull the file back towards you once. This must be very accurate because this is a starting point for all our cuts. Again, depth keys can be used for the exact spacing and depth of the cuts if you have depth keys to this manufacturer's lock. This happens to be a Schlage, which is used by a number of different companies. The depth keys are, of course, accurate for those companies, too. Now we're going to smoke the blank again, and we're going to file again, smoke again, and file again. You notice once we've done this a couple times, we tilt the key back and forth at different angles to see the marks. Once we see a mark, we file. This procedure is repeated. You must be careful if you file down too far, allowing the driver or upper pin to fall into the cylinder, into the plug, you've ruined it and must begin again. So only file where you see marks. Some marks will disappear and then reappear as other notches are filed down, allowing the pins to come in contact with the blank. Again, we're going to put it in, twist back and forth hard, pull it out, and now we don't need to smoke the blank because we can see the marks. We can see the attack points shown here. We have three major file points. We file that, put it in, do it again, reread. Now the notches are becoming quite visible. We're going to file it down carefully, making sure that we leave our cuts round and smooth so they don't hang up on the inside pins, which can force you to break the key off or create scratch marks and false cutting marks. Often we look on the back of the key. We're inserting again, twisting. It's hard, sticking, but it does work. We've now opened it up. It's more than 15 degrees. Here's a look at the key. We've actually filed down next to the key it fits. We happen to have made a master, although that was pure luck. Notice the difference in marks from a cut key and a filed key. This is a look at a device used for impressioning. We do not recommend this device. It isn't worth the money. And now we're going to take a Schlage key gauge. On this gauge, we can take a key and measure the depth of each cut. This will give us the code number or cut number used by the manufacturer. This gives us a three. As far as we can put the key in, we can tell the first cut's a three. We go to the second cut and try it. That gives us a nine. We continue through the key and we have a code. Notice the code is stamped on the key. Now, some keys are codes are direct. Look at the key and see if the cuts correspond to them. If they do, it's a direct code. If not, it's an indirect code, and we must get a book that lists the manufacturer's depths. These are depth keys from the manufacturer that give us, each key gives us a spacing and one cut. There are nine depths in a Schlage, including a zero. We can now take the code we have from the key and put it in a key machine, or in this case a handheld key cutter, put a depth key in and cut the cut. This will duplicate the key cut by cut. We can also go directly from the code on some code machines simply by dialing in the code. We're using the depth key here for spacing only. Now once you're done, you remove the blank. We have clipped this C blank six times 
according to the depth keys and the code. The code is sometimes on the key, sometimes on the lock, sometimes direct, which means you can read it. Sometimes it's indirect, which means you need a book to correlate it. This is a book that gives us the depth charts, and notice the depth keys next to it, for different types of locks. If we don't have depth keys readily available, look it up in this type of book. This gives us the spacing between the center of one cut to the next, plus the depth of, e of each cut. This is an ace lock. It has the tumblers arranged in a circle, supposedly for high security. This is a Pickmaster's pick set for picking ace locks. Ace locks were thought to be impossible to pick until these types of picks were invented, and now it's easier to pick an ace lock than it is to pick a regular lock. Ace locks are often on vending machines or other devices holding money. We insert the pick. We adjust the tension on the back of each individual tumbler holds in place by rubber bands and actually sets each tumbler allowing us to open the lock. Unlike conventional picking, once you've opened the lock, we can read the pick, as you'll see us do in a second, and make a key to fit the lock. That was actual time in picking an ace lock with a Pickmaster's ace lock pick. Some groups go around the country using these picks, making keys and stealing from laundromats and other establishments a little bit of money each month before the regular takeout day, making forty to fifty thousand dollars a year in change. Now you'll notice we have the pick here. It has taken the form of the actual key. We've picked the lock. We now can take this pick, measure it with the depth key provided, and make our own key. In this case, we would end up with keys to any number of picked locks. Many people don't realize that they're being stolen from and should vary their collection days to see if the amount of collection varies. Thieves who do this normally have the schedules down very well. Now this is the depth key we're going to measure on the knob end. This will give us the correct depth for each tumbler in the ace. The next lock we want to discuss is a common lock. It's known as the key in knob lock. It's found in apartment buildings, houses, medium security applications. This is a typical key and knob lock. Now you'll notice it's a one piece unit. The door goes here. The knobs are on either side of the door. The key, for obvious reasons, due to the name, fits in the knob all the way and opens the lock. These locks share a number of common characteristics that we're going to deal with at this point. Besides the key fitting in the lock, most of these locks have a tailpiece that fits inside from the plug holding the knob and the lock mechanism on. It's clamped on the door by actions, screw actions, by screwing this little cover here. On some of the earlier locks, it is possible to, when it's locked, unscrew this cover, which exposes, you can't see this real well, take my word for it, exposes a small tailpiece right here. On some of the earlier locks, you can punch with a center punch, this tailpiece out, and it will unlock the lock. This is not true on any good lock. On some of the locks, you can unscrew this plate that's on the outside of the door and hit the tailpiece with a center punch, which may pop the lock out, allowing it to open. As I say, this isn't too common on new locks. Some of the very cheap examples of this lock, the plug itself may not be held in by the tailpiece, but may be held in by springs. If this is true, you can pull the plug. Again, this is very rare. It was uh, used a number of years ago on cheap locks. You don't see it much anymore. And we're going to look at one of the most common examples of this lock in use today, and that's the Schlage wafer lock. This is a Schlage wafer lock sitting here. Now, you can tell it's a wafer lock. If you see the key, it's very distinctive. Or you can look at the lock itself. And on the lock, you'll notice the keyway is quite distinctive. This keyway does not take a pin tumbler key, but rather has a side-mounted obstacle bar and wafers. This lock can have up to seven wafers in it, depending on how it's set up. I'm sorry, seven tumblers, seven wasters, one master, three series, and possibly four combination. Now, the key on a wafer lock is very distinctive because all the cuts on the key are either full or nothing. There's no depth cuts on this key. If you see a Schlage lock, it's the distance between the wafers, the lands and grooves as it were, that determines where the wafers are. If it's a cut, it goes all the way down to the middle of the key, allowing the wafer to operate. You'll notice this has 
several cuts on top, and then has a fitting wafer cut on the bottom. This lock was thought to be extremely difficult to pick for years because of the construction of the keys. A normal pick will not pick these wafers, nor will it operate the lock mechanism itself. Now, Schlage's were made for a number of years, or millions of them in use all over the country on normally the inside of uh, apartment buildings, office buildings. The Schlage wafer unit is made in two different varieties, the A and the W variety. This simply means the keyway is made differently. The A keyway and the W keyway are not interchangeable. But in the A and W groups, there are subgroups of one and two. So you have four possibilities, <laughs> four rather, possibilities of a key fitting in the lock. Once you've overcome that, you still have to line the wafers up and align them to the shear line on the key to get it to turn. Now, the way to do this, there are a couple ways to do this. One very unique method that's very little known is a computer, a mechanical analog computer that will feel out the wafers and give you a readout. This computer is made by a company called Unitec at 1501 6th Street, La Grande, Oregon, 97850. This computer is about 80 bucks. What it is is two different plates wires running down them and wafer marks on the uh, wires themselves. A front plate that has numbers on and two positioning wires. Now, how this works is, if you find a Schlage wafer lock, you choose the computer that will work, either the A or W model, you insert it in the lock itself. And when you do this, you stop as you hit each wafer. And as you do that, these wires will turn, and they'll line up with a number. In this case, we have an 8. Insert it in a little farther, and you get the next number. In this case, a 7. Once you've done this with all the tumblers in the lock, the computer provides you a little wheel. You line up the code from the probe on the inner wheel to the number of that was on the lock. In other words, 8 was the first one. And that will give you a readout, a direct readout, to cut a key that will fit and open this lock. In other words, you don't have to pick it. You don't have to impression it. All you have to do is use the probes, line it up with the wheel, read the numbers, and then you buy a Schlage gun, as you saw us use earlier in the film when we were impressioning, or go to a locksmith or use a, a, a locksmith grinder, and you just simply set the key up, cut it to the Schlage codes, and it will open the lock. This is one way of doing it. It's about $80. It works very well. There's another way. And we're going to show you that in one second. And what that is, is a special pick that picks Schlage. You have four different so-called tension wrenches, which are actually half keys. You can see it here. I'm holding both of them. I've got them set up at a 90 degree angle. They bend. First thing you do is ascertain whether it's an A or W. And you do that by trying to fit it in. If it fits in, you've got the right one. If it doesn't, you go to the other one. Now, you have two choices, marked one and two, on each one of the A and W. You can tell which one fits by putting it in and seeing. If it's the right one, it'll fit snugly and move the wafers. If it's the wrong one, it will float in and out and not correspond to the wafers. Now, to pick this lock, you also have a pick. This pick is a small piece of wire, the handle, and a beveled sharp end. The way you pick this, I'm going to demonstrate in just a moment. So what we're going to do here is take the two tension wrenches, more or less, that we've used. And we've ascertained that the number one fits in this keyway correctly. So we're going to put it in there. Take the pick. Again, it's simply a stiff wire with a sharp beveled edge, as you can see there. Place the pick in the lock all the way to the rear on top of the tension wrenches with the beveled side facing up. Place tension on as you would in a normal lock picking operation, perhaps a slight bit heavier. Then apply upward pressure on the pick so it hits the wafers that are above the tension wrench. As you apply this upward pressure, you pull the pick out. I can hear the wafers clicking. I'm still applying the tension. Now I'm going to relax the tension a little bit. I hear the wafer click, another click and the wafers fall in and pick the lock. That's it. One try, 
an unmodified Schlage wafer lock. That will pick every one of the millions of Schlage wafer locks in the country. And you can see it's still locked, but it did pick it. Let's see if I can do it again just as fast. Beveled edge up, tension in, tension on, apply upward pressure, pull out, relax the pressure, letting each wafer click into place, and open the lock. That will open every Schlage wafer lock in the United States that fast. Another way to open locks, whether they're key and knob or flat or mortise or whatever, is to drill and create a new shear line. Two ways to do this. One is to use a small drill and drill right where the plug goes into the cylinder. So you're drilling through the pins and creating your own shear line in effect, which will allow the lock to open with the use of any instrument, screwdriver, or whatever that will turn the lock. Now you can do this freehand if you're good enough by drilling right at this point. Other way to do it is use a drilling jig. Now this is a drilling jig. This device has two little pins on it that are designed to go into the lock plug itself and then a hole that's automatically lined up for an eighth inch drill. We use a uh, cobalt uh, drill again and some locks may have hardened plates or steel dead pins as they're called mix in with the other pins to make this operation difficult. However, it can still work with most, most locks. Now this is one drill jig. This is another one. This is a flat drill jig. It's used with a mortise type lock. For a key and knob lock such as this, we use a curved, slightly concave drill jig. I'm going to place this in the lock, line the pins up so it holds itself in. This gives me a hole. I'm going to use the drill you've seen us use. I'm going to place the drill in the jig, the bit fits perfectly. I'm going to drill, be careful with my fingers. When the drill, when the drill hits the back of the lock, you'll feel it go through, and it's gone through all the pins. I'm removing it. Now you can see the hole that's left there. It's drilled through the top pins, and in essence created a new shear line. I'm going to take a screwdriver, insert it in the plug, where the key would go, turn the plug, just as the key itself would turn, opening the lock. The pins have sheared off all the way to the back of the lock, creating our own shear line. This is a very fast, effective technique for opening almost any type of lock. Some high security locks have, as I said, built-in steel dead pins or sometimes ball bearings, which make it extremely difficult to drill through. We're going to try a high security lock in a moment and see how that works. But while we're still on this lock, I want to point out there's another way to drill. Besides using the eighth inch drills I did here, you can take a safe drill, put it here, and drill out the entire plug. This, of course, removes everything in the way. Stick a screwdriver in, and you can open the lock. I prefer using the drill jig for accuracy and using an eighth inch cobalt drill. However, if that doesn't work, or you hit dead pins, or it, for some reason just doesn't function, take a big drill and drill out the lock. If you see a lock that has a hole in it like this, you know what happened. Of course, the lock cannot be used again, but it effectively opens it. Here we're looking at a keyhole, keyhole the way you'd look at it. This is the end vision of a normal keyway. You can see the slot effect where the key would fit in, turn the plug, open the lock. This, as we've seen already, is an ace lock. An ace lock, as you recall, simply has the pins arranged in a cylinder around the plug. The key can be situated as center or left or right. This one happens to be center. uses the key of the indentations, as you can see, to let the pins come in. Now, we've shown how to pick these locks already. Move the tailpiece. How to pick these locks. There's another way to get into these locks in a hurry, and that, of course, is drilling. Now, to drill an ace, you don't want to drill out the plug if you can help it. Rather, Use a special drill. It's a cylinder with very small teeth on it, sharp, small teeth. Cylinder fits over the plug in the ace lock and actually reaches the pins themselves, allowing you to saw through and cut the pins. Now, this is one example of the saw. Here's another one, slightly different. This one grabs the plug and goes in on the outside, cutting it. Here's a replacement plug for the lock. You can see the cylinder configuration. Now, we're going to try and drill this lock out. By the way, as someone reminded me, you should always wear eye protection, which I'm not when you do this. <clears throat> and we're going to saw through the pin.
And when I've reached the end of the pins, I'm going to leave the drill in, stop it, and then gently withdraw the saw. I'm doing this gently so the pins don't have a chance to jump out of their holes, which they will do. And once I've got it out, I can then actually go in. You can see the pins are sheared off. I can remove the pins one by one, starting at the upper left. In this case, the lock would have to be upside, uh, right side up, of course. Starting at the upper left and working counterclockwise. I then place the pins down in order from left to right as I take them out counterclockwise. This gives me the pins one through seven in the correct order. If I want to make a key for this lock, I can then line the pins up, which I'm not going to bother to do here, and read the lengths on this code chart that we're going to show you in just a second, and duplicate a key to fit the lock. Of course, I've ruined the lock by doing this. I'm going to take the lock out, and to actually get the pins out, you can see them, the power coming out. I've got to shake the pins out, get the shrapnel out to turn the lock. But if I wanted to make a pin for this now, uh, rather a key for this, I could take the pins out and lay them in order. Now, this is just the, the uh, bottom pins, of course, starting at the upper left-hand side, lay them in order, and make a key. Now, this would work if this is a master key lock, so the same lock is on a number of machines or a number of uh, devices, and you want to duplicate the key. You take the pins out, as I said, lay them down, and you can make a key for this. Let's take a look at some high security applications from the key and lock standpoint. First of all, these are what's known as spool or mushroom pins. These pins are used as the driver pins in pin tumbler locks. You can see by their construction there's a lip at the top and bottom. Mushrooms just have one at the top normally. When you pick a lock with these type of pins, normally it's just one or two in the lock. The lock will pick slightly, turn sideways, and then this pin will catch on the edge of the lock, making further turning impossible and jamming up your attempt to pick. These can be picked, as we've shown, by reverse picking or very careful use of the tension wrench. We also have some high security keys. This is a DOM key, DOM key, has side mounted dimple depressions that the tumblers fit, in, fit into. You notice this has nine separate locations for pins. And the fact they're on the side makes it extremely hard to pick. The locks cannot be picked with normal conventional picking techniques. You notice the pinholes vary in size and placement. I have seen this type of lock picked once by a man who took a popsicle stick, put it in the lock, wiggled it back and forth, drew it out, and then used a pin to press depressions into the side of the stick. In about two minutes, he impressioned the lock and picked it. But this is rare, and it requires a certain touch. The next set of keys we have are an American lock keys. And the reason they're higher security is they're double bited with different bites on each side of the key. This makes it, again, extremely difficult to pick. You've got to pick both sides of the lock at once while using tension. You have to use a double-sided pick to do this, and it takes a real touch. It's very hard to do. A more conventional set of high security pins are the Sergeant Kesso. These again are dimple pins. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tumblers in this lock on the side, which again make it extremely hard to pick. And on top of that, if you turn the key sideways, you will see, very, if you look closely on the top, there are three magnets on each side of the key that are embedded in the key. So besides picking the Sergeant Kesso dimples, one has to have six magnets aligned in the correct north-south alignment to open the lock. They're hard to drill. They're extremely high security locks. Problem is, they're hard to open if you lose the key. They're more expensive, and most locksmiths cannot key them. The next type of lock we're going to talk about is known as a mortise cylinder. This cylinder is just part of a larger lock. Normally, it screws in the lock. You can see threads on the side. It sits flush in the lock, so it doesn't stick out. There's no knob. So it always goes to a deadbolt. The lock is usually held in place. There's some slots on the side by a screw that runs perpendicular, screws into the cylinder. This prevents you simply sticking a key in and unscrewing the cylinder and taking it out and operating the lock. Normally, just one screw holds these locks in, which raises some interesting points. One of the easiest ways to defeat these kind of locks, mortise lock with a screw going in from the edge of the door. The edge of the door would be right here. When you open the door, you can see the head of this screw. If you have access to the lock during the daytime, 
and you can loosen this screw slightly. No one will notice. The lock will still operate. The cylinder will not fall because it's threaded in. So if the screw is loosened up slightly, then it simply takes putting a key in and turning the cylinder, unscrewing it, pulling it out. This leaves no marks. It's virtually undetectable. But of course, you've got to have access to the door when you can open the door and loosen the screw without anyone seeing it. The other way to undo these screws, if the lock is screwed in, you can sometimes take a pair of channel lock pliers or a pipe wrench, put a paper washer you cut out around the sides of the lock so it doesn't scratch the wood of the door up, grab it with a pair of pliers, channel locks, or a pipe wrench that grabs it, and force it, rip it, which will break the tip of the screw off in the slot, snap it off, and let the cylinder come out. If you have another screw to put in the lock afterwards, this leaves virtually no marks. If you're investigating this type of opening, look in the side slots and see if they're scratched or if there's evidence of a screw being broken off in it. Now, they've smartened up with these type of locks, and many of them now use a guard ring. This is a soft brass guard ring, as you can see, with a very heavy inner core. This ring is put together, and then the lock is placed in it. This makes a flush mount out of the lock, which makes it extremely difficult to grab with any type of wrench, as you can see. If you run into this, this ring must be pried off the screwdriver or cut off the pliers. And a solid ring like this is very difficult to cut. So you've pretty much got to pry it off, and of course that's going to leave marks on the lock, and get enough room that you can grab it. It's very difficult to rip out or wrench out, as it's called in the trade, anything with a solid guard ring. Now there's one tool, which I happen to have that most people don't. This was made by a locksmith friend of mine. Took a pipe just about the size of the cylinder, cut a couple slots in the side of it so the pipe could compress slightly, welded a nut onto the side of the pipe, put a bolt through it. Now, this has an Allen wrench adjustment. I can put this over a cylinder, tighten it down onto the cylinder, and I can grab this rod here and wrench it out by twisting. This is a very unusual item that works quite well. If you want to make one, I don't know where to get them commercially at the moment, but it will wrench out anything it can grab. You can see the bolt going through with the welded bolt on the side. Now, there's one other option. Some of the cheaper locks and some of the more expensive ones, actually Schlage, again, our friends at Schlage, instead of being mounted by side slots, a smooth area, as you can see, they use in the back a couple of set screws. You can see the holes right next to the tailpiece, the cam and the tailpiece. Screws come in from the back and hold this lock in the door. So the screws are actually mounted this way. On the earlier Schlage's, the screws actually had their heads coming through here where you could take and unscrew the heads and then remove the cylinder, thereby opening the door. The newer ones have a metal plate put over the screws. However, you can see where I've marked it here. If you work with these type of locks at all, you'll get so you can recognize that's where the screws go. If you drill here and here, you can drill off the heads of the screws in a real hurry and pull the cylinder out. This device is known as a slam hammer or slap hammer. It's a device that's actually used in body repairing for automobiles. It consists of a rod threaded at one end, a counterweight, and an adjustable head. You use this by taking, they furnish these, a metal cutting screw, sturdy, strong screw that screws into metal. Put this through the head, screw the head onto the shaft, and then if you're working with a lock, primary candidate being automobile ignitions and some trunks that have a plug that comes out of the lock. Also, some key and knob locks of early cheap design are simply held in by springs on the side of the plug. Most later ones are not. But if you have an auto lock or one of these locks, you can take this, put it into the lock itself, into the plug, tighten it up, screw it in, and you grab the back of it and you slam it. That action, that weight, will tear the plug out from the lock and allow you to open the lock with a screwdriver. This is the commonest tool used by auto thieves. This is how you take an ignition lock out of a steering column or of a dashboard, stick a screwdriver in, and start the car. How I like to use the uh, gun is to use a normal tension tool from the bottom of the lock, apply some tension, back it off, put the gun in before I apply tension at all, use the gun, and then apply tension. Nope, oh, missed. I can hear, can hear the pins catching. And apply tension as I, oh, there we hear the pins coming down. 
No tension now. Start bouncing it. There we go. Caught the pins. And we have unlocked it. Now that was luck. It might take longer, it might take less time. Let's take a look at another form of lock. This is a file cabinet. Uses a pin tumbler lock, so it's medium security. When you lock the lock, all it does is turn a lever to block the drawer from opening. The key actually acts as a turning lever. Now we're going to leave it locked in this position, so if the door was shut, it would be locked. I'm going to take an assortment of spring steel. This was purchased from ESP, which is a major lock supplier, but you can also get it from automotive suppliers. Spring steel is thin, malleable, and it's in different widths. We're going to take one of these and attempt to use it as a key. Now this trick will also work on some padlocks, some key and knob locks, and so on. I'm going to slip it in the lockway, bypassing the pins. I'm not picking it. I'm going back to the turning bar. If I'd sharpen the steel, this would be easier. But if I press it in, I still may get it to work here in a couple seconds. We'll try it a couple times and see if I can get the spring steel to grab the uh, turning bar at the back of the lock and actually, and I just slipped it out, actually unlock the lock. There we go. Just unlock the lock in a few seconds using a simple piece of spring steel. Now, another thing to consider in this is if you have a desk to open. Desk drawers are often locked by a bar that runs the back of the door and a bar underneath holding the drawer shut. If you take a long piece of steel or a knife, such as a bread knife, slide it in underneath the desk drawer and slide it from side to side, you will knock the bar off, unlocking the drawer, allowing it to be opened. This way effectively bypasses the lock, allows the drawer to be opened, and leaves very little markings. If you're investigating this, always look on the lock bar itself to see if there are scratch marks where someone has forced a knife in and forced the drawer open. First thing we're going to look at here, some padlocks. Padlocks share a number of things in common. We're going to look at both combination and key. This is a master five pin keyed padlock. It's probably the average padlock you'd run into. Now there are a number of methods for picking this lock and for bypassing it. Again, methods from other locks apply. It's possible to pick this, it's possible to impression this, it's possible to use a slap hammer and pull the plug out. First thing we want to decide is on the padlock which shackle opens and there's what direction does the shackle open. This can often be told by looking at the lock or having seen a lock similar in design. The reason we want to know that is there are a number of tricks you can do on the shackle itself to bypass the locking mechanism. The shackle is held in place by a dog that actually veers into the shackle. When you turn the cylinder plug, it removes this and lets the shackle pop out. It's possible to go around that through a number of methods and defeat the shackle mechanism, allowing it to come out also. We're going to look at a couple of those mechanisms. They may not work the first try with me. They may. We'll give it a shot and see what happens. If you have a locked padlock, it's known as bouncing whereby you can sometimes bounce the shackle out of the locking element. An interesting way to do this is to take a pair of pantyhose or nylon stockings, cut a piece of it, and tie it around the lock. The reason we're doing this is the nylon provides the correct resiliency to bounce the lock out of the shackle. You can also use a piece of rope. However, nylon socks seem to work best. Tie it around the shackle, the locking part, and then around any solid object. Now, of course, if the lock is locked on something, you're going to reverse this and tie it around the lock itself rather than around the shackle. But for our purposes, we're going to try it this way. Once it's tied, we want to pull it taut, remembering which part of the shackle opens. Then we're going to use a mallet, preferably a wooden mallet, to strike the shackle and try and bounce it away from the dog opening the lock. Sometimes this can be done in one quick wrap will open either combination or key padlocks, just as you've seen. This next technique is great for anyone who's watched the Rockford Files or other TV programs and always wanted to open a lock with a paper clip. It's actually possible to take a wire, in this case I'm cheating and not using a paper clip, but a thin wire purchased from a hobby store. What I'm going to do is try and place the wire, force the wire in against the locking shackle, the same lock, so it will force the locking dog apart. The lock is locked. I'm going to take this thin wire 
forcing it in on the locking side of the shackle. Again, we're forcing it into the shackle, between the shackle and the case, and pressing down on it, wiggling it from side to side to try and pop the shackle. We just pop the shackle. It's a thin wire, like a paper clip, forces it between the locking dog and the shackle. This will work on key locks, combination locks. It doesn't make any difference because you're bypassing the locking mechanism and forcing it away from the shackle. Take the same padlock. It's open, as you can see. Lock it. Put it in the vise. And do it upside down so you can get an idea of what I'm doing. Take our old friend, the electronic Cobra pick, tension wrench. Put the tension wrench in the bottom of the keyway. Now, you notice I'm using one finger to provide the pressure. This often works to provide the correct pressure. I'm going to insert the electronic pick in the keyway as best I can upside down. Turn it on. And in those two seconds, as you may have heard, we just unlock the lock. That's where an electronic pick or a snap gun or alternate pick methods sometimes work like that, impressing the hell out of whoever you're with and opening the lock just like they do on television. Always give it a try. Some key padlocks still employ warded keyways where obstructions or wards block the key from turning. It's an easy way to pick these. There's a commercial set of five master keys that are cut so they bypass the wards and still engage the end of the mechanism opening the lock. This $20 pick set you see here will open virtually every warded padlock or other type of warded lock available. If you watch here, a couple of tries, we'll find the right master key. It slides in all the way, does not engage the end, but does go by the wards. Try one other one and we'll see what happens. This is a master 1500 series padlock. It's pretty typical of a combination padlock. In fact, it's one of the better ones. The master padlock can be opened by manipulation if one is careful enough. By pulling out on the shackle while turning the dial, one can feel the gates fall into place. The later masters are harder to manipulate. There are several things you've got to bear in mind. All combinations are right, left, right. The combination numbers will all be even or all be odd. Therefore, if you pull out and find the third number, which is generally the first number you find, it will tell you if they're all going to be even or all going to be odd. The second number is a minimum of one turn to the left past the first number and a maximum of eight numbers short of two complete turns. The second number will also be at least four numbers less than the third number. The third number, as I said, can be found by moving the dial while pulling out on the shackle and feeling the gates. Normally, the combination numbers will be either large, small, large, or small, large, small. The new masters have false gates built into them because too many school kids were able to pull the shackle out and find all three numbers. However, with practice, you can still do this on a master. You can also hook our contact microphone up to it and listen for sound manipulation with fair success. However, there's one very easy way to open any good lock. Like many keys and locks used in furniture, padlocks, automobiles, etc., the master has a code. The master code is stamped on the back of the lock. It's not a direct code. It refers to a master code that is published. Therefore, if you read the back of the lock, and in the case of furniture or automobiles, read the key and read the number. And then you buy a book, in this case, a Baxter, published by Baxter Systems, available through any of our lock suppliers. This lists all master combinations from 1968 through the present. Occasionally, you have to buy updates, which this is. This lists the newest masters. If we look at our code, we see it is 902633. By opening this to the right pages, we can find that serial number or that code number, and there is a combination, 240212. Let's give it a shot. 24, all the way around to 2, back around to 12. 
that's how to open most padlocks, furniture locks, and automobile locks, if possible, by the code. It should also be pointed out the master 1500 series is susceptible to shims and wires against the locking dog, just like we did the master key lock. It's also possible to drill three holes and read the, key, read the wheels to get the uh, opening combination. But this is pretty ridiculous for a padlock. If you're going to go to the trouble of drilling it, you might as well drill it out and open it up. You'll also see us test a master 2000 lock. Now this lock has ball bearings that hold the shackles in, a hardened steel case, a hardened shackle, and is a much, much better lock and more difficult to open. In fact, we'll take it to the firing range and see how it holds up. We've got the master padlock again that we looked at earlier inside. What I'm going to do is take 36 inch bolt cutters, just about the most severe bolt cutters you can get. You'll notice they have a fairly new jaw, they're strong. We'll see what they do in this hardened shackle. I've not tried this, I have no idea what's going to happen. Bear with me, please, as I shut it. Well, as I try and shut it on the. Uh, I got one side of the shackle in. I'm going to use my arm pressure. And we'll see. It's a hardened steel shackle. This is a hardened steel shackle, folks. See what we did? We made a slight mark, not anywhere near a halfway cut. Uh, we marred the surface of the shackle. This is a 9mm Mac fully automatic suppressed weapon ball ammunition. Take a couple shots at the master padlock and see if it lives up to its reputation. As you can see, the 9mm round hit the back of the master lock, penetrated, and did it go all the way through? Did not go all the way through, and the shackle remains all over the lock is not in great condition. The shackle remains locked, and the lock actually appears to be almost in functioning condition. On magnetic padlocks and magnetic door locks, which are being found more and more, it is possible to develop your own key system. Take a piece of soft iron or steel, easily purchased, bend it in a U-shape, buy some magnetic wire this is about 16 gauge wire. Wrap it around the bar several hundred times. Now it would be wise to cut this bar into a thinner shape on the end so it would fit into keyholes. For our purposes, this would work for a magnet. On one end of the wire, you put a diode capable of handling at least two amps. Then you splice it into a plug and plug it in the wall. This effectively gives you a half wave rectifier. What this means is when this is fully wound, covered with friction tape, and has a diode in line with it, radio shack parts, it will turn on and off 30 times a second, reversing its magnetic field. Once it does this, you can plug it in, hold it against a magnetic padlock, or insert it into a magnetic keyhole, and it will vibrate the magnets 30 times a second, putting them into opening position and opening the lock. It will also ruin the lock. It will demagnetize the magnets in the lock, and there'll be no way for anyone with a key to get in afterwards. But for a one-shot, this will open almost any magnetic lock, no matter how sophisticated. Now we're going to look at opening cars. This is a whole separate subset of locksmith techniques in itself. There are a number of ways to deal with cars. We're going to start with the easiest and work to the more complicated. Most car locks are based, same principles, that non-car locks are based in. Most are pin tumbler or wafer tumbler locks. The difference is some cars, especially GM, use a sidebar that runs through the wafers or through the tumblers, locking them in place unless the correct key is put in. This makes picking them extremely difficult. When you put the key in it, moves the sidebar so you can open the lock. If you try to pick it, it will not do this. And because of this, they can't be picked, or it's very difficult to pick them. Some car locks can be picked. They all can be impressioned. It's also good to remember that cars have a VIN number on them, vehicle identification number. This number, along with sometimes serial numbers of the car, correspond to a code book that gives you the keys, the cut depths, the numbers of the keys to make and fit the car. You can buy these books. You can go to a locksmith that deals with automobiles and have them make up a key if you have the VIN number of the car in advance. This is also true if you can call a dealer where you bought the car and get a code. Uh, they'll usually give it out to you if you can convince me the guy that bought the car. This is the easiest way. The next easiest way is to use a key. Luckily, we have some keys. These are one of the few things that ever made money in comic books. 
These were sold at one time through the mail. They're tryout keys. This set now costs about $70. This particular one, I believe, consists of about 225 keys. One of these keys will open every GM car made from 1967 until about 1984. This is possible because the tolerances used in automobile locks are sloppy. They have to make so many locks, and they only have X number of combinations, so the tolerances are sloppy. Tryout keys are used by putting in the lock, shaking it back and forth, applying tension as you would a lock pick and opening. Very few GM cars during the fall during those years cannot be opened with this key set. As I said, these used to be sold in comic books for about 20 bucks. It was a good hobby for people that write comic books. You can now buy them from locksmith suppliers. You can get them for almost every type of car made. Uh, this is the easiest way if you have the time and don't mind the high visibility of opening cars. Now we have a couple of high-tech devices that open cars. We've demonstrated rocker picks in the padlock section of uh, this film. Rocker picks, you put in the lock, you don't use a tension tool, you rock them up and down and use the tool itself as a key opening the lock. They're making rocker picks for Ford and I believe someone has some out for GM as I speak for this. They work pretty well. About 20 rocker picks will open most Fords simply by wiggling the ignition and turning. Now we have an even higher tech device. It's kind of small here. This is a key blank for a Ford, not cut. And you'll notice the black along the key is latex rubber. It's a brand new idea. Take this key blank, they actually come in a set of uh, enough keys to fit all the Ford keyways. You place it in the ignition, you rock it up and down. If you do this just right, pins will set into the soft latex and stop at their shear line. Pins actually press their little tips into the latex as you wiggle it, and then once at the shear line, you can turn it and start the car or open the car door. These are brand new. It's a real good idea. I suspect will be expanded to other locks. It doesn't work every time, but it's certainly worth trying. These are available from a couple of the lock suppliers that we list at the end of the tape. Well worth purchasing if you're going to work with cars. Now, after that, we get into some of the more standard methods of opening cars. First thing we suggest you do is you buy a kit. This is a lovely little black thing as a holder. You can purchase from almost every locksmith supplier now. It's called a Slim Jim Carry-All Master Key Set, Master Opening Set. Comes with anywhere from 7 to 12 tools designed to open almost all cars. The tools work well. This set, instead of buying them individually, gives you all the tools plus some instructions to use them. Now the tools, basically, the tools you see most often are the good old-fashioned Slim Jim. You've seen cops use it, locksmiths, tow companies. This is the original Slim Jim. This will open many, many cars in the market. However, they developed some anti-Slim Jim devices because so many people were using these. Because of that, they've developed other tools to compensate for it. This is known as a round Jim. With these two tools, you can open probably 70% of the vehicles on the road today. Let's look at the way that this works somewhat. If you can uh, take my artwork here. In theory, this is the inside of three different car doors. Yes, I know it doesn't look like it, but it is. This is a normal button-type lock. You press the button down, it presses down the rod, turns the cam, locks the door. You, on this type of lock, you've got several options. You can use the Slim Jim sometimes, put it in, hook it on the locking rod. If I pull up here, it will pop the button up and locking the car. Again, go down, hook over the locking rod, and pull. Some cars, you go down here, catch it, and push on the, this end of the locking rod or on the cam itself. That, again, will pry up and pop the button up. An easier way to do that is to use the round jim. The round jim, if you can get it in the car, you put it in between the window, as you do with the slim jim, and the car body, bring it down, put it underneath the button, and pop it up. That will pop the button up quite effectively from that angle. You can also use the round jim sometimes to come down and catch the rod, as you would a slim jim. You can see the little bent tip there. Catch the rod, push it down on the cam or on the other side of the rod, popping the rod up. This lovely thing is known as a lemon pop or a scully strip. One would assume Mr. Scully invented it, since there's no other reason for that name. Simply a piece of very flexible yet stiff plastic, some holes punched in it. You buy these for about five bucks, you get three of them, along with some white cord, as you see here. This little device works on any car that has a push-button type lock. This includes a Porsche and a Mercedes. 
You simply push this in between the window and the body, push it down using the correct length of strip or cutting it yourself to fit, hook it over the button, as you can see our vice is doubling as a button here, pull the strings, tightening up on the button, and opening the lock. That would have popped the lock, opened the door up. Leaves no trace of its passing, five bucks, or you can make it yourself. Great idea. Again, we're gonna take a look at the Scully strip. Now remember, this is just a piece of plastic. You can see I have forced it in between the door and the frame of this lovely Mercedes we're going to borrow. And I've run the string material, can be dental floss or wax string, through the holes, made a loop, taped the loop, and hooked it over the doorknob. Now, I've, the glass obviously is down for our demonstration, but normally it would be here. Plastic's in there, I'm gonna grab a hold of the string and simply pull. You can see it tense up on the uh, door when this car goes by. See it tense up on the door and we just open the Mercedes. That's how easy it is. You can see the loop once again. Loop it this way, you use a piece of tape, force it over, pull on the strings and it opens. And that is how easy it is to take a Mercedes. You can see the strip itself, simply moderate stiffness plastic easily forced between this piece of rubber and the door jam down here. Very good for Porsches and Mercedes. Remember that if you have a Porsche or a Mercedes. This device is known as a Sidekick. See the clever little logo with the boot on it? Comes in this leather pouch, consists of a couple different pieces. This is used on ignitions, preferably Ford or GM. Put the key in the ignition. Take the Sidekick. This is a saw, cylinder saw, like we used on the ace locks. Put it around the guide, drill into the lock, then pop the lock out. Sometimes you have to use a slam hammer. Take a screwdriver, start the car. Works extremely effectively. You also need a drill with it. About 70 bucks from locksmith suppliers called a sidekick. We'll start a lot of cars. Of course, it also destroys the ignition, but that's all right. We're going to look at an example of the inside of a car door, the use of the Slim Jim. This is not an average door, but it's built like an average door, so it'll do for our purposes. Taking the interior panel off, you can see the inside of the door, you can see the window, you can see the lock rod. To use the Slim Jim, we would come in here, go down, grab the rod, and pull. This would unlock the car. Some cars, we grab the rod and push. This is a fairly common setup for older cars, even exotic sports cars, as this one is. It'll unlock the door immediately. That's how long it takes. A few seconds, grab the rod and push or pull. The thing to remember about any entry technique is anything man can build, man can defeat. Strategy and planning are the keys to getting in, opening up, defeating anything. Look at the job. Can you afford to leave marks in your passage? Is it easier to pick something? Sawing a dead bolt in half, jacking a door open? Or is it better to throw a treble hook over a limb and climb up and get in a window that's open? Does that take less time to make more sense than trying to pick an exotic lock? Consider these things, plan it out. In time, you've got to get in something. Choose your tools, decide on the main method and a fallback method. Then employ them. The safe was invented in medieval Europe and was usually made of wood with one or more bolts that would drop into place with a locking mechanism. In the 19th century, the modern safe was actually invented. Although most people don't realize it, there are actually two very different types of safes designed to do two very different jobs. The first steel safe was designed to protect important papers or paper money from a fire, not from a burglar. These safes had a steel outer layer and then some sort of insulation such as cement, asbestos, or plaster of Paris to keep the inside temperatures fairly low during a fire. The usual burn temperature of paper is above 350 degrees. So therefore, most of this installation kept it below that. In the early 1900s, UL or Underwriters Laboratories began testing and rating safes on their ability to withstand a certain temperature for a certain length of time. Insurance companies based their policy costs on these ratings even today. What we're looking at right now is a fire safe cut away. As you can see, it looks from the outside like a standard modern safe with the handle, and with the type of dial with a spy-proof ring. 
Here's a cutaway of a modern fire safe, which actually uses a stabilized water installation. The stabilized water, or uh, some people consider more of a, of a solid foam type material, is right here, as we can see inside this cutaway safe. What you see here, the wires are, when they pour the, the foam in here to solidify, it just adds more solidity to the unit. Um, as we come down this way, you'll see more of the, insul of the uh, ins fire installation. And then as we come across right here, you will see security. This is the first stage of burglary protection, as we'll be talking about. Um, right here are hard pins in this arbor protecting the handle mechanism from individuals pulling it out, inserting a mechanism in there, and tripping the, boat and the boats. As we come through here again, you'll see a hard plate. This is the hard plate protection to allow to uh, say pr the lock mechanism protection. Can you see the lock? Right here, so no individual can drill, drill, look at the look at the wheel packs and determine a combination. There are drill bits such as cobalt drill bits that can get through this. Nevertheless, it does deter the burglar. And this, what you're looking at, is not a burglar resistant safe, but a fire, a very good fire safe. As we go through here, you'll see the dial connected by spline to the wheel packs. The wheel packs being a three wheel pack here. You can look at this and see the three wheel packs. Okay. As we go here, there's a heat baffle. What the heat baffle does is, again, it absorbs heat and dissipates the heat in case of fire. This is an outer panel, and if you look at it, this is a quarter inch mild steel. Now, as we look at the mechanism, I'm going to tilt the cutaway safe all the way down so we can see the wheel pack. The wheel pack is here. It's usually secured by a relocking device. So in case there's a burglary attempt of punching out the dial, the bolts are usually stopped with a spring mechanism to prevent retraction. You'll notice that the wheel packs, when they're engaged, a bolt is drawn back, the handle can open, and the door can then be unlocked. Okay, as we see here, when the right, correct combination is dialed, the bolt retracts therefore allowing the locking bolt retracts, therefore allowing the door bolts to also retract, thereby opening the door. If you notice, this is approximately three one inch steel, and there are other mechanisms to lock the door, the door in different places. These control also the one inch bolts, one inch steel bolts. If a burglar had the opportunity to drill out this locking dog, they would free this up, thereby allowing the door to open, or if somehow the burglar attacks the wheel pack and allows, and after drilling of the wheel pack or the, or the dropping lug allows the boat to retract, right, thus, again, it'll free up the, the safe door. Okay, the wheel pack is the first area of security. The wheel pack allows the locking dog to drop, thereby retracting the boat. If the wheel pack is not on, locked, dropped out in any way and a wire is inserted into the lock case and the boat is pulled back, that will allow entry into the safe. Now, the second way is the boat locking the boat itself. If the boat is somehow drilled or knocked out, it will also allow, thus, like this, it will also allow the handle to retract and the boats also retract, thereby allowing the door to open. Elimination of that can be done also by drilling. And the third would be the actual attack on the boat itself. If the boat bars were located, drilled, and pulled, they can also pull, and pull the boats back and thereby allowing entry into the safe. 
The most conventional way of entry into a fireproof safe would be to removing the dial and punching out the wheel pack with a long punch. The wheel pack would come out thusly, thereby allowing freedom of boat action. Since this whole pack would not be there and we punched out, it would allow boat action, thereby opening the door. That's the first attack. Second attack would be, of course, drilling past the outer case to the hard plate to the lock mechanism, thereby reading the combination, dialing the combination, and thereby uh, opening the bolt, allowing the traction of the outer bolts. This is a look at a Sergeant and Greenleaf three number combination lock. This is the most common lock used in the world on safes. Many safe manufacturers license them from Sergeant Greenleaf and use them. You'll notice there's no retracting bolt. This is because the three numbers are dialed in and then a fourth number is dialed to actually move the bolt. You can recognize these locks once you've worked with them a little bit. There's several ways of attacking this. Now if you notice, this is the way the bolt works. The combination has been dialed in. The wheel pack on top is lined up. It has allowed the fence to drop in, which allows the cam to move and retract the bolt, as you can see. That's actually attached to the bolt. Pulls the bolt in as we turn the dial after having dialed in the three numbers of the combinations. You can easily remove the dial of this type of lock by placing a screwdriver underneath it, prying up, prying off the guard ring. This allows punching out of the wheel pack. But as we'll show right here, this mechanism is called a relocker. Its, its design is to prevent you from doing that. The relocker is held in position by the wheel pack. If we punch off the wheel pack, this lever falls into place by spring tension into that hole you see in the bolt. This prevents the bolt from retracting. This is a simple way of preventing punching off the wheel pack. You can, however, drill, drill in at a 90 degree angle where you see the relocker, reach in with a piece of wire, and pull the relocker back towards you, freeing up the bolt after, of course, punching out the wheel pack. Or you can actually drill out the relocker if you know where it is. Most of them are in this 90 degree position. Aligning a cobalt drill can be done by using a template. Photographic templates for a number of locks are available. After we've pulled off the dial, we can put this template on the front, and this will show us the exact position of the relocker as well as other drill points. The template again is placed on the outside after you remove the dial, and from there we would drill right here to remove the relocker. Now here's a look at the fence falling in, allowing the wheel pack to operate and operate the lever retracting the bolt. Again, this is after the combination has been dialed in. On older safes, it was possible to listen with a sensitive amplifier and use sensitive touch to feel this dropping in place. As I explained to you about a fireproof safe, the major reason for the existence of the safe is to dissipate heat to keep it under 350 degrees to preserve paper contents. This, if you look at it, has a quarter inch steel outside shell, which means practically anything can drill through it. And of course, the thickness of this is really to contain the insulation or the, the solidified waters, as we talked about in a previous cutaway safe. The bolts, again, are one inch metal bolts. Now, this particular safe does have a relocking device, thereby if any individual punches the dial, removes the dial and pushes the line in, it will automatically lock to prevent the handle from opening. This, of course, on this particular safe, one would only need to drill a hole right about here where the locking bolt is, drill out the locking bolt, thereby re allowing release of the 
locking dog and door opening. Now we are looking at another money safe. If you notice, all money safes do not have wheels, while most record safes or fire fireproof safes have wheels. UL tests money safes and record safes according to their resistance to a professional burglar. To be UL rated, a money safe must weigh 750 pounds or be attached to the floor, must not have wheels, and money safes, if made before 1960, have round doors. The UL listing is very important because it establishes exactly how much protection any safe actually gives. Many safes are basically heavy metal boxes which do not offer much fire protection. Look at this door, this massive TRTL 15 by 6 door. We see the one half inch to two inch bolts. We see the thickness of doors all around. If we, it translates to the same as the wall. Because this is a by six, all six sides are protected with the same type of protection as the door. A burning bar is a very efficient method for opening safes. This is a hollow steel bar with high pressure oxygen forced down it. The bar is ignited and burns as you see. The old burning bars created fires and you had to have a fire suit to use them and an extinguisher. Very high temperatures, melting steel like butter. There now is a new small portable burning bar. Today we will demonstrate a fast and economical way to penetrate hard plate. This is hard plate. It might not look like much, but if you don't have the correct tools, it's hard to get through. We're ready to burn. Strike the torch and put it in the hole. The torch is powered by oxygen, and as you can see, it really gets hot. We're through the double hard plate in about six seconds. All I'm doing is picking a spot back in the safe where I know there's no hardened anti-drill plate and drilling through to the interior. As I said, this would expose the tumblers if I was going through the closed door part. I'm not. I'm going back for, for a reason. I'm going to start at lower speed. We add a little cutting oil. And now into the interior of the safe. Now that was a one-hour fire-resistant safe. The drill bit is the next most important thing. This is a cobalt-tipped drill bit. They're very new. This is probably a $15 drill bit, but worth every cent. It stays sharp much longer, and it is made to go through very difficult-to-drill materials, including hardened plate. My next choice to get in a safe of this type would be to lock the safe, drill the hole just as you saw me do, except drill it more forward. Now you'll notice there still is no, no more protection here on the roof or on the sides as there is in the door. It's thinner, there's no hardened anti-drill plate. So I can drill any place up here and get access to the interior of the safe. Had I drilled the hole farther forward here into the door area, and this is very, very mild steel by the way, very easy to drill, I would have had access to the interior of the lock mechanism. Once I get inside here, the gates, the tumblers are open to view. Now, I have a hole going through, and I have access to the lock area. What you do at that point is take something developed by the medical profession. This is a fiber optic borescope. This transmits light coherently from this end to this end. I can put it up to my eye, and I can read the numbers on the dial of the safe or anything else I point it at. Uh, effectively, it moves my eye from here to here. These are used in the medical profession. This one is about $250. It does not contain light. It's the only problem with this one. You can also now buy it from safe people. Safe people are using it. Of course, the medical profession, it's used to go in rather unpleasant places in your body and allow the doctor to see your tumblers as it is. We're using it in a little more safe and sane manner, I like to think. Had I drilled the hole up here, I could place the fiber optics into the safe, turn the dial, and watch the tumblers and actually see and read the combination as the tumblers fall into place and open the safe. Now, this would be a little too dark to do, so the cheapest way out of that is to use a probe light. Now, probe light we've used in opening cars. It provides a very direct, very pinpoint spot of light. If my hole is big enough, I can put both the probe and the fiber optic into the hole and read the tumblers and open it. If I want to go up a step, the next fiber optics, which run five to eight hundred dollars, contain a built-in light source and are no wider than this. So you can drill a smaller hole than I drilled, actually, and you have a pre-lit, flexible snake that allows you to go in and look at the lock and open the lock. The advantages to this is it's pretty quick. 
You don't have a hardened drill plate to go through. You see what you're doing. You leave a small hole in the top of the safe. If you are locked out legitimately and trying to open the safe, the safe can be re-welded, can be plugged and re-welded with very little loss in security, unfortunately, because, of course, the top is not all that secure anyway. Why do we drill a hole farther back? Well, we're going to be a little more crude about opening our safe. For a long time, people have blown safes with explosives. This is fairly crude, sometimes results in the loss of the contents, the safe, occasionally the person blowing the safe, and sometimes the apartment building. There's a European technique that so far has not been found much in this country, uh, and it works quite well, and that is to hydraulically tampen the safe by drilling a hole into the interior of the safe, as we did, anywhere on the safe. The safe can be in place, can be moved. Then one fills the safe up entirely with water, as you probably remember from your high school physics class, water does not compress. Therefore, the water acts as if the safe was filled with an inert object that will move when any pressure is applied to it. Pour the water in through the hole, take a small amount of explosive, much less than would be required to blow inward against a strong steel door, shut up anything from dynamite caps to C4, place in the hole, water is filled to the very top of the hole, and dam it down with a little clay, get to a safe area, set off the charge. When this is done right, the charge, especially a fast burning charge, will go instantly. The water will expand, filling the volume. There is no volume to fill. The water will blow the door off the safe or blow the safe at the seams. If it's done correctly, the interior of the safe will remain fairly intact. It's possible to even save paper money along with harder items, of course, if this is done right. In fact, we're going to try that today. We're using an explosive expert who has a license. We're going to place thousands of dollars, risking our own money, I should add, into the safe in a couple different places. And we'll also place a couple of books and uh, coins on their paraphernalia in the safe. And we're going to take the, lock the safe up. We're going to take the safe to a safer location, just in case we're a little off, and we're going to try the hydraulic method and see how it works on film. As far as, as, far as I know, it's the first time this has been filmed. It's the, one of the first times it's been done in this country. Also today, as long as we're going out and blowing up a safe, and we're in a fairly safe area, I should add, we're at a gun range, it's protected, I'm going to demonstrate a couple other things. The first thing I'm going to demonstrate is a chemical known as thermite. Thermite, we'll give the formula, I'll show the formula on the board after this, it's composed a very simple formula of iron flakes and aluminum flakes. It burns with an extremely hot flame. This, these containers contain thermide, which is a commercial preparation of thermite. These are cheap and available. These were purchased from Sergeant Sandy. Uh, these have something mixed with it, I suspect, probably sulfur, to make it burn a little easier. It's a bit difficult to get regular thermite burning. Uh, some people that make their own thermite add... Uh, I'm going to blow it. Do it again. Polyamine. Some people that make their own thermite add toluene to it to effectively light the thermite and give them a chance to get away. As you're going to see, thermite is a very noxious chemical. You don't want to do it in a house if at all possible. It will start anything else around it on fire. Uh, it sends off poisonous and noxious gases. However, it will melt through steel very effectively. These are hardened steel plates a quarter of an inch thick. Once the reaction starts, it's almost instantaneous. There it goes. Watch that. It's literally gotten hot enough to melt steel in a matter of a second. Boiling the steel plate, hardened steel plate, it's bubbling. Right now, you can punch through it with a screwdriver. First thing you should do when you're attempting to open a safe you don't know the combination of is to try factory tryout combinations. Remember, all safes come from the factory set to a combination. They are intended to be changed with the change key by the owner to whatever private combination they want. A number of people don't realize they're supposed to do this. A number of people are just too lazy to do it. So a fair number of safes out there are still set to factory tryout combinations. This is a list of the most common tri factory tryout combinations. First of all, try 50 for all three sets of numbers. Then, try these three combinations here. If it's a safe that takes four digits, four groups of digits to open, 
Again, try 50 for all four, and then try these three. Uh, this will open a fair number of safes out there right now. Here are a couple of unique sources. One of them is for the electronic lock gun. As we said, the electronic lock pick it was made by an American, but the only place as of this moment that carries it, it's called a Cobra. It's a place called Microsonic Alarms at 20 Rickard, R-I-C-K-A-R-D Road, Empire Bay, NSW, Australia, 2256. They run for the neighborhood of $200, as I recall. Very good source. One of the best for serious locksmiths, serious students, or serious security personnel is Lockmasters Incorporated. They sell courses, good, safe courses. They sell the burning bar, the burning bar lance that you saw, uh, the training film we used. It goes through safes like knife through butter. They are one of the only suppliers for this lance, and they sell the smaller lance that doesn't need all the exotic uh, fire equipment, extinguishing equipment. They also sell, they say, safe courses, drill harnesses, uh, even baseball caps. They also give courses in safe opening, safe repair. You can go to their office and take. Lockmasters Incorporated, and they're located at 5085 Danville Road, Nicholasville, Kentucky, 40356. Again, a very good source. Another kind of unique source is for the drilling templates for the safes. The templates to show where to drill that we showed are available from Learning Unlimited, post box 99038, San Diego, California, 92109. Now, if they're not in business, there's probably something else around selling them. Uh, or you can look at the safe. If you know what kind of safe you need, look at it when it's open, and you can figure out your own drill points and make a template. A real good supplier that we've had good luck with is something called Treesat, T-R-E-S-K-A-T, Locksmith Supply, and they're 1694 Montauk, M-O-N-T-A-U-K Highway in Mastic, good names, M-A-S-T-I-C, New York, 11950. They have a Watts line, and they sell some very good up-to-the-minute picks, some of the rocking picks, some of the latex picks, uh, very small quantities, good outfit. Save the best thing for last. There's one, one pick that it's like nothing I've ever seen. This is the most, the most fantastic pick I've ever seen. I've been able to open every lock that I've wanted to with this. This, this is outstanding. You won't see this anywhere else but on this film because it's, well, shoot, I would show it to you, but I, I can't find the damn key. Sorry.